Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Metabolic Classroom. I am Professor Ben Bickman, biomedical scientist in all things metabolism and professor of cell biology. One of my great pleasures is to explicitly study fat tissue. I am a fat scientist. That is one of the cell types that I explore the most, whether it's cells, fat cells growing in my lab in a Petri dish, or whether we are taking biopsies of fat from humans to study how fat tissue works. Uh, drugs for fat loss, and specifically the GLP-1 agonists, these are going to encompass virtually any drug where the uh, the suffix of the name of the drug is a uh, lutide, like semaglutide or liraglutide. Indeed, semaglutide being the most common. That's the one that is in the very, very popular drugs, uh, Wagovia and Ozempic, and used in other ones as well. And they have different trade names even that continue to kind of stack onto the complexity. So there's a lot of different ways you can call this. The main mechanism of drug uh, of action rather for the GLP-1 agonists is the reduce the reduction in cravings now remember remember being uh, me saying that because you watched it before um the earliest use of the GLP-1 agonists was used at a much lower dose than is commonly used now and this was a dose that was effective at inhibiting glucagon insulin's opposite Whereas insulin seeks to reduce blood glucose, glucagon seeks to increase it. And it's, in fact, a hormone that most diabetics type 1 and type 2 struggle with. In other words, diabetes is just as often a disease of too much glucagon as it is a disease of too little or not functioning insulin in the case of type 1 or type 2, respectively. So at the lower doses, GLP-1 agonist drugs worked by reducing glucagon and thereby improving diabetes. And then at these higher doses, the, the famous mechanism of action now is that food is moving much more slowly through the intestines. So whereas in the untreated individual, they eat a meal and the food sits in their, sits in their stomach for, say, three to four hours or so before you know, getting mulched around, before moving down further into the small intestine for digestion and absorption, the food may sit in the stomach for up to 24 hours or something, uh, a much, much longer time. Um, and because of that, you just don't want to eat. So it really starts reducing cravings. Now, one interesting note that I did not discuss before is that one of the common side effects of these drugs is sexual dysfunction or a loss of libido. So when cravings are reduced, it goes beyond just the cravings of what you're going to eat. So that's just something to consider. And again, they do work, no doubt about it. By stopping eating, you will lose weight. As I elaborated earlier, however, up to 40% of that weight loss can come from lean mass. And then if the day should ever arrive that a person decides to get off the drug, they will regain their fat mass very easily. But the ability to regain that lean mass that they've lost is really going to be um, dependent on a lot of variables, particularly age. And if we're talking about someone who's a little past middle age, good luck gaining that lean mass back. It's going to be very, very difficult, if possible at all. So firstly, exercise. Um, my mantra when it comes to exercise and weight loss is that you exercise to be healthy or strong, and then you eat smart to be lean. You don't exercise to be lean. If one of the reasons you're exercising is to get thin, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Now, I don't want you to stop exercising, but that's not what exercise is good for. Even the American College of Sports Medicine one of the leading authorities on exercise has stated, probably reluctantly, that there's really no evidence that suggests exercise alone is effective for weight loss. You just can't really move the needle much. Now, it, it might help a little, and there's a little evidence to show that minute for minute visceral fat uh, is more affected, that that is the fat that you're going to burn a little more relative to subcutaneous fat. And that could be because visceral fat is more responsive to epinephrine. Epi epinephrine is one of the stress hormones, and one of its many effects is to stimulate lipolysis or fat breakdown in order to be burned by the body. Well, again, visceral fat is more sensitive to epinephrine. 
And so a little bump in epinephrine is going to have a relatively greater effect on the visceral fat. So in that sense, exercise may help, but on average, you exercise to be strong and you eat smart to be lean. And by lean, I mean shrinking fat cells. So that then takes us to nutrition. Now, again, this is something we've talked more about in previous episodes. Um, and what I always want to highlight with nutrition is the fact that too many people get it wrong. So remember, the journey is shrinking fat cells. And a person can start this fat cell shrinking journey with one of two steps, cutting calories or lowering insulin. Now, most often, of course, people just take the cutting calories step. And the problem with that is if you begin immediately reducing energy intake, but you haven't addressed your elevated insulin, you are going to put your body into this state of relative energy deficiency. Now, what I mean by that is, and this has been validated by studies, including those by David Ludwig at Harvard, uh, and he's done this really well. His group explored the total energy available in the blood. And by that, I mean, they actually measured all of the calories and nutrients in the form of nutrients in the blood and found that when diets were increasing insulin, the total energy availability in the blood was down because energy, because uh, insulin wants to promote the storage of energy. So if you start eating less, but your, your insulin is still high, your result, this is leading to an, a general reduction in the amount of energy available in the blood. And the brain senses this. The brain senses this low energy because it's not like the fat cells. It can't store hundreds of thousands of calories. The brain has to, with its very high metabolic rate, needs to almost constantly be relying on the energy that's available in the blood. So the brain is very sensitive to energy changes or the energy status available in the blood. So if energy coming in goes down or, or the person's cutting calories, but they haven't really addressed their high insulin yet, um, then they're going to get hungry. So again, if the first step of the fat cell shrinking journey is cutting calories, hunger will win. This is why you never see a reunion tour of the Biggest Loser game show. You will never see those people on a stage again because they've gained it all back. And in many instances, they've gone even beyond where they were before. Because hunger always wins. If, you're, if your strategy is based on cutting calories without addressing insulin, now I'm not saying calories don't matter. In fact, I'll revisit that in just a moment. But there is an order to this that is much more scientifically supported. So rather than the first step being cutting calories, keep that foot in place for now on this fat cell shrinking journey along this pathway. The first step needs to be lowering insulin. Lowering insulin creates a metabolically advantageous milieu within the body. When insulin goes down, um, metabolic rate will go up um, substantially even, up to 300 calories higher. That's a pretty meaningful amount. And you also begin creating ketones. Ketones are simply products of fat burning. And that's what happens when insulin is down. Remember, the human metabolism engine is a hybrid. It's burning glucose if insulin is elevated, or if insulin's down, the metabolic engine is burning fat. Well, if insulin stays down for an extended period of time, you're burning so much fat that you almost are burning too much in the liver, and then the liver begins creating ketones from all of this excess. And the interesting thing about ketones is ketones have a caloric value roughly comparable to glucose. And when a person is making ketones, they begin excreting them in their breath and in their urine. These are calories that are just being eliminated from the body. So that is the metabolic advantage that comes with a low insulin state. And at the same time, because insulin is low, the body is releasing this energy into the blood. The total energy available in the blood is higher. And so the brain is sensing this feast and thus says we don't need to eat. And so it's no surprise that when someone is controlling their insulin, they don't need to worry about cutting food out, cutting calories, because they begin to control their appetite. This has been shown pretty consistently in human studies that put people into two groups. The low-carb ketogenic group tends to control calories on its own, even though that group is often calorie unrestricted. In a handful of studies, they've done this. They will take a low-fat, low-calorie diet and compare it to a low-carb, calorie-unrestricted diet. And these people begin just 
controlling calories on their own. They just have this improved satiety.